Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special episode of the Built on Purpose podcast, where each episode I interview exceptional leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, philosophers, and straight up interesting people to explore their outlook on life, work, and leadership. My hope for our listeners is that you can take away a special nugget of information from each of these interviews, something that will serve you and the people most important to you in pursuing a life built on purpose. My name is Brian Moore, co-founder and managing partner of Y Scouts, and today I'm interviewing Kat Taylor, the co-founder and co-CEO of Beneficial State Bank. Kat, well, let's just say she's really smart. Harvard grad, JD and MBA from Stanford, sits on Harvard's Board of Overseers. The list goes on and on. But beyond her impressive accolades, Kat's purpose in work is restoring social justice and environmental well-being. What's fascinating is that Kat is working to restore that sense of social justice and environmental well-being in, wait for it, the banking industry, an industry she describes as just above oil and gas and government in terms of popularity. We're going to get to more of that in just a minute. In this interview, we'll deep dive into why Kat is motivated to keep affection in business for good, the business model behind Beneficial State Bank, and of course, Kat's badass tattoos. Without further ado, please enjoy this special interview with Kat Taylor. So I really appreciate you spending the time with us here this morning and uh, where I'm, I'm really excited to start. Uh, I had an opportunity to watch uh, the Be Inspired event that you did in Burlington not too terribly long ago. And one of the things that I found so fascinating as you were sharing the popularity level of banking is ranking just above oil and gas and, and government in terms of its popularity. And given yes. the uh, yeah, given the not so high popularity marks of banking, uh, to have planted your flag in banking and starting Beneficial State Bank, I, I would love to hear more about why you chose that uh, to make your difference in the world. It's great. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. Banking is um, very boring, complicated, and uh, reviled, I'll say. The, you are correct. We are third from the bottom of the most recent Gallup poll uh, assessing the popularity of uh, 100 industries and oil and gas in the federal government are the only ones <laughs> below us. Um, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a four-letter word after the Great Recession, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a very important um, system and dynamic in the American economy and in society. It's the way we look at it is uh, banking is actually the original and most powerful form of crowdfunding. It's not technically taking a person's deposit dollars and funding a specific loan. I don't mean that. There is the fractional reserve system that, that drives banking. But it is deposit funding that finances uh, the American economy. And the two primary functions of banking uh, have been and should be providing that finance for the economy, the amplification of the money supply is another way to think about it. Um, and then when needed, liquidity for the depositors who provided the funding in the first place. So when we need to buy a car or a home or send someone to college, those kind of expenditures are large lumpy expenditures and we need to finance them too. So um, there are $12 trillion, I think, at this moment in time of depositor funding in the American economy. That's a very large number. And we feel that uh, the reform of banking that's most needed is to rebalance the critical stakeholders of banking and meet their expectations. So, of course, we have responsibilities to shareholders in the bank system, but we also have responsibilities to the depositors who provide that funding, to the borrowers who are trying to build the new economy, to the communities that will be so greatly influenced by the nature of our economies, and to the environment upon which we all depend. So we wanted to take a, a sort of refreshed view of banking and design a bank model that could prove it was financially viable at the same time that it produces social justice and environmental well-being by respecting those stakeholder groups. 
And when that bank model was proven, which it now has been profitable for several years, use that uh, to reactivate uh, communities of deposit capital, communities of, of equity capital, and most importantly, human capital to redirect the banking system, to change the banking system for good. It's just way too powerful in terms of the societal outcomes it produces not to pay a lot of attention to it. Well, and you have certainly furthered that mission by the way you've organized Beneficial State Bank in that all of the profits when made are given directly to the foundation for a reinvestment into uh, the communities that you serve. Can you talk a little bit about perhaps was there any pushback by any of your stakeholders, maybe with an emphasis on uh, some of the original investors or shareholders at that type of a model, which is incredibly different from the traditional banking model? Yeah, yeah. So that um, there are three features to our bank model that are radically different from um, banking as we've known it in the last 30 years. Um, the first one, we're not expecting the banking system to take up necessarily, but it is, as you say, that 100% of the economic rights of Beneficial State Bank belong to the Beneficial State Foundation. That is a public charity foundation, so it is permanently governed in the public interest. It cannot be controlled by private individuals, and it draws its representation from uh, three organizations. Uh, the, excuse me, the um, Tide Foundation, which is a broad uh, national grant making foundation to us representing community development, to Bridge Housing, um, uh, the largest affordable um, nonprofit housing developer on the West Coast, representing fair access to housing for us, and until recently, East Bay College Fund, um, a smaller uh, but very effective nonprofit in the Oakland area. Uh, we're um, representing to us access to high quality higher education. So the, this, that governance is very, very important. Um, and, it, and it is reinforced again by the bylaws of that foundation that say, say if and when the foundation receives any profit distributions from the bank, and it's the only entity that can receive profit from the bank, uh, the, the foundation must reinvest those funds into the communities, the low-income communities we serve, and the environment upon which we depend. Now, I, I will tell you that in the early life of a bank, and we are very, very regulated and embrace our regulations, um, we are not allowed to uh, distribute profit through the dividend process. The regulators want to see young banks keep retain their earnings, keep their earnings internally to fund growth. So until we get to the point where we can issue dividends, we have capitalized the foundation with external resources, and the foundation gives away in sponsorships of nonprofits in all of our communities and markets, the equivalent of about 10% of our profits each year. So we're trying to live up to that promise before we're actually technically allowed to do that. But you are correct that if the front uh, end of the banking cycle is a form of crowdfunding, that deposit gathering and lending, the back end of profit distribution in our model is well a, a very high complement to the bank's activities. Yeah, so I'm curious from a from a team building standpoint, the individuals who you have enrolled at Beneficial State Bank to help you pursue this mission has having the structure that you have and where these profits are reinvested through the foundation, has that served as a point of both, uh, both a benefit uh, in attracting the right type of people as well as, I guess I could say equally, a benefit in repelling those who are more traditional in the way they think about the banking business? Um, yes, and I'm, uh, I'll backtrack a second because I didn't answer one of your questions. The way we, that was a very, it is a very unusual model. And while it precludes some things, it opens up a big opportunity set. And it is mostly that mission alignment that uh, potential colleagues who come to think about working at the bank are very excited about the integration of their values with their work, and I think it is a very com big competitive advantage in recruiting 
top-notch um, colleagues. Um, it is also, uh, frankly, uh, provides alignment to the, uh, especially institutional depositors like large foundations, community foundations, uh, nonprofits who want their money to be working uh, in complement of their values and program activities while it's you know, basically stored at a bank. Um, and uh, it, it is also um, a way that we can um, talk to, so in the beginning of the bank, all of the capital was provided by myself and my husband, so we didn't have to convince anyone else that this was a good model to invest in. But over time, as the bank grows, we need to attract additional investors to provide growth capital. Um, and we are now to the point where um, a foundation or a nonprofit, or excuse me, a foundation or a family office that has a charitable vehicle. In fact, a couple are actually considering putting an investment in the bank through their charitable vehicle. So we keep our ownership alignment that 100% of the economic rights belong to some form of a um, foundation or charity. Um, and the way they look at it is uh, they can get some return on their investments for their charity to make more grants, but they also deserve and get the pro rata share of our impact. Our impact is the second area that's different about our bank from the traditional bank models. Um, I mean, a lot of, all banks have impact, good or bad, and a lot of them have a lot of good impact. They might, you know, have very elite community reinvestment departments that do a great job, you know, building affordable housing and uh, contributing nonprofits, et cetera. No, no bones about that. They do a lot of really good stuff. But it isn't the preponderance of what they do, and it isn't uh, there. It doesn't preclude them from doing things that might actually be quite antithetical to all those public benefits. So they're kind of dragging a train of misery behind uh, really good lending activities in many cases. In our bank, we made a commitment that at least 75% of the loan dollars outstanding at beneficial state banks will always be in mission hands. So those are borrowers, nonprofit or for-profit, who are producing renewable energy, sustainable food, affordable housing. They're borrowers like cooperatives and B corporations. They're uh, previously deprived uh, borrowers, women and minority-owned businesses, low-income communities, nonprofits. And we, we measure where those dollars go and what they do when they get there. And the reason we commit a preponderance, that 75%, is that if we don't do that, we won't be driving to the new economy that fully includes the racial and gender just and environmentally sustainable. We'll be reinforcing the old one. If you flip the ratio, that's exactly what we'd be doing. And by the way, the other 25%, which is often less because we are often over 75%, but can't be working against our values as a bank. It can't be the train of misery. So that it might be rather neutral lending, but it can't be contramission. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that your explanation of that, and thank you for that, certainly aligns to this uh, emphasis that you've spoken about quite a bit around how to keep affection in business for good, um, which is something that largely has been absent from business in general. It was Freud who said work and love are the cornerstones of our humanness, yet somehow we have not integrated those things in business. We have for, for a, you know ages and ages kept love out of the workplace, yet this is something that you have been speaking about and, and demanding is good for businesses, this idea that affection belongs in business. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Oh, sure. Thank you. I'm glad to be considered in the, in the same uh, breath with those very lofty and noble ideals. I, the, the ideal we set for ourselves is benefit to harm, uh, benefit to all, harm to none. Ooh, that was a terrible part. So benefit to all, harm to none. <laughs> and that extends uh, whether that's how we're in relationship with our colleagues or our communities or the environment. Um, and it does mean, I love that you use the word love, I often use the word opinion. Like we, everything we do, we infuse with our opinions about what is benefit and what is harm. 
we don't succumb to sort of financial fatalism. If the numbers work, then do it. If they don't, don't do it. We violate that, the sort of financial first and only rule in both directions. Um, we do have to be sustainable from a financial standpoint so that we can keep doing what we're doing, but we are trying to create you know, the best place to work. That's actually high, highly correlated. That ranking, best place to work ranking, is highly correlated with um, out, uh, outside performance financially, too. So it's smart to do that, but it's also the way we want to show up in the world. As a uh, modern corporation, we are a B corporation, a very highly rated B corporation. That's important to us. We need to be constantly improving our corporate practices for the benefit of our colleagues, for the benefit of the environment, our customers, um, and that constant chronic process of self-assessment is the only way we can be honest about that, uh, especially because we broadcast the results. So uh, we also are just labeled, that's a food style label, getting at 22 social justice practices in the corporate environment. And we take pledges, we won't finance coal, coal, oil, or gas, we pay 150% of living wage in all markets. Um, it's kind of um, suggesting that we are, in an existential sense, the sum total of everything we do. So we have to be really evaluating um, what's our lending practice accomplishing, but also what are we doing? How are we in relationship with all those important stakeholders? Um, and I do think that is uh, increasingly I, I, I believe everybody always probably wanted to live that way, but they didn't feel they had the choice. And I think increasingly, um, generationally, people are creating the choice and taking it, and we can be part of that movement. So is this where, uh, this feels like a great spot to uh, speak at least briefly about the impact uh, it sounds like John Rawls had on you. And for those uh, listening yeah. who don't know John Rawls, he was an American moral and political philosopher and a professor at Harvard. Um, and, and you've made mention that, you know, his influence or his point of view has, has impacted some of the rules at Beneficial State Bank. Can you, can you expand a bit on that and the impact John has, has had on you? <laughs> yes, it might be my own personal infusion of philosophy, but I do, I, and, and I, uh, I'm a lay person, so I, I might reduce it incorrectly, but the way I think about it is he was suggesting design the world as if you don't know what role, where you'll land in it, what your resource allocation will be, what your capacities will be, what your obstacles might be. So another way to think about it is we all do better when we all do better. So let's solve for that. Bring 100% of us through, not some sort of hierarchical um, kind of fierce competition where a few do really well and everyone else kind of suffers. So I do think that's at root of the bank's philosophy, a, re a firm belief in the, um, uh, the value of every individual and uh, our ability uh, for everyone to do well if, if that's what we set out to do. Um, I think um, that's, also at root of our newest tagline, which is change the banking system for good. It seems so improbable for a now 600 million in assets bank to say that when the biggest bank in the system is $2 trillion in assets, that's three times bigger than the Veterans Administration. And we know how difficult and challenging it has been to run the Veterans Administration. So running $2 trillion organizations is uh, complex and the jury is out about how well anyone could do that. But sure. you get my point that we are overwhelmed by the size of the banking industry. Nonetheless, if we don't aim that high, we won't activate the incredible power of the collective. It is those depositors that have the ability to put their deposits where they want them to be or to change the institutions where they are and say, this is what I want to be a part of. Can you meet me there? So um, we have a lot of belief in the um, value of every individual, the power of the collective, and that we actually will all do better when we all do better. And that's an equilibrium or a stasis that we can get to. We don't need to stay in the reductionist one uh, where sort of a competitive hierarchy keeps every 99% of the people down. 
Uh, it's it's incredibly refreshing to to, to hear this. Uh, it, it provides a tremendous amount of hope. Uh, clearly, the way things are working today on a whole uh, are less than optimal, and organizations like yours who are charting a new course are exactly the uh, the recipe we need to uh, to improve you know life and well being and uh, and social justice for everybody. So uh, it, it's awesome. I, I, I'm curious. Uh, as it relates to the leadership team, I noticed as I was looking at uh, the, the leadership team for Beneficial that you have a co-CEO, Daniel, and I'm wondering um, how that decision was arrived at and frankly, how you two strengthen and balance one another out. It, it seems to be a bit of a departure from what you'd find at any other bank to have a co-CEO relationship. Yeah. Um, it's very new age, isn't it? Um, and actually, we ourselves resisted it for a while. Um, this is an unusual organization in its human c capital development trajectory, too, because uh, while Dan and I both have backgrounds in banking, we are not career bankers. Uh, we are, uh, both of us, just devoted to the mission of the bank and devoted to building the human capital of beneficial banking in general. So we're always trying to organize in whatever is the best way for the bank. In the beginning, we, I was actually the third CEO of the bank, um, but uh, I was just a, a traditional CEO, well, a very non-traditional, but we had a traditional org chart, put it that way. Um, and as the bank was growing and evolving, we have to actually grow a movement and an ecosystem at the same time that we grow and run a, a unique bank model. And uh, more and more, we thought we really appreciate a, a more of a flat uh, organizational structure because we're also building the future human capital of the beneficial banking movement. So we need to bring more people up, give them more responsibility and opportunity so that we grow the ranks of these uh, beneficial bankers. So it made a lot of sense eventually um, uh, to become co-CEOs where Dan can focus on the organizational development and human capital growth of the bank itself. And not to say that he isn't also out on the road doing business development and speaking and things like that, but that's his focus. My focus is the external role, the development of resources, of the ecosystem, of the movement, um, of the visibility, of the value proposition. And then we come together and work jointly with, and with the whole team on growth strategies and product development, M&A. We just announced the signing of a definitive last week to merge with a wonderful uh, financial institution called Pan American. Uh, it's really the combination of finance and thrift. It has been a very honorable and good auto lender in five branches of the Central Valley uh, and Pan American Bank, which is a um, legendary Hispanic Latino bank in East LA and North Hollywood. Um, so there's a, we have to do a lot of things at once and uh, we need all hands on deck and we need fully empowered, uh, endowed uh, executives. So why not spread the authority a little bit more to get all of this done at once. That's fantastic. Just great. So I, I'd like to, if I can, I want to transition for the last few minutes we have here to a couple of uh, more personal things that I, I just find fascinating. One of which is the amount of educational accomplishments that uh, you've achieved to date. Uh, you, have, you, you are someone that uh, I would consider a relentless learner. What are you learning mm -hmm. today? What What are you going after? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, um, thank you. That is a high compliment. I hope I am a lifelong learner. I'm actually thinking about going back to school when the dust settles a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think my approach to learning the in past is a little bit credential oriented, uh, being aware as a woman that um, sometimes you need over credentialing to step into certain economic sectors or to step back after a timeout. I, in my, in my more mature years, really value learning for its endemic value period, for keeping an open mind and, um, uh, to, you know, sort of accruing more knowledge and more experience and learning from many, many other people. So I am 
deep right now in learning around financial system issues because of the bank and there's so many experts out there and so much rethinking. We actually run two venture companies alongside the bank so that we can participate more in the new economy. And as a result, we meet remarkable fintech companies, financial technology companies. And so I'm learning um, so too late. I'm learning much more about technology, but but also just about new ways of organizing um, financial systems. So we follow the cryptocurrencies. We follow all the new banking platforms. We have investments in some of them. I've said, and I'm going to hold myself to it, but if we're not half technology companies, half banks in five years, I think we'll miss a giant opportunity and, and actually requirement. Um, I am very lucky in that I still get to stay pretty involved with Tomcat Ranch, which is our family ranch that is more like a learning laboratory around uh, land management that addresses climate change, healthy food, biodiversity, water management, et cetera. That's where I think I want to go back to school. I think I need to go get um, a degree in biochemistry because uh, soils are so important to our road forward and have been misunderstood for some time. Um, but I, I think it's actually the learning journey is that collective one, too, uh, because so many times I find myself learning new things amidst a whole group of people who whose point of view is just make much more robust the learning offering. So it's a great time to be uh, alive and learning and part of the greater collective. That's fantastic. The, the, the last thing that I'd like to touch on, um, you know, I hope you'll indulge me is you've got some pretty badass tattoos. How do you <laughs> choose? <laughs> how do you choose what you're going to decorate yourself with? I have to know. <laughs> Uh, it well, honestly, it was a little too haphazard a couple of times, so I'm on hiatus. But I was just thinking that I might be due for another tattoo. Um, the tattoos that have the most meaning to me one is a uh, Navajo sun because the sun is the source of all energy, and uh, um, and I have deep respect for the long running indigenous cultures that managed to live on this planet for 10,000 years, which um. We're struggling to do it at the moment. So, and then uh, anyone's inspired by my children, which are a few. But honestly, the first tattoo I got was just to shake myself up, to you know, um, stay different and uh, make a commitment to diversity that would never go away and that would be quite visible to others. Um, so, uh, the, I might go back. For, I was thinking about this because we now have this constellation of bank branches and offices, and uh, I was teasing, but maybe I should I was teasing our new colleagues that um, if I couldn't keep all the names straight, I would just add them to my tattoos. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. Well, Kat, this was absolutely fantastic. I cannot thank you enough for spending some time with us. Um, once again, Kat Taylor. Uh, co-founder, co-CEO of Beneficial State Bank, and a true visionary uh, in the space. And boy, what, what a pleasure to chat with you. We wish you all the best. Thank you very much. It's a glorious opportunity to alert everybody that they can change the banking system for good. So bless you. Until next time, thanks for listening, folks. You can obtain a transcribed version of this show and hear more interviews from the Built on Purpose podcast on our website, yscouts.com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, I have two things for you. Number one, I'm hoping to get some bonus questions answered by Kat from our listeners. So if you have any questions you'd like me to pass on to Kat, please drop me a line at brian at yscouts.com and I will certainly forward your questions on. Second thing, if you enjoyed this episode, there's a couple of others I think you'll love too. If you're into banking, we have an episode with Vince Siciliano, the CEO of New Resource Bank in San Francisco, where we explore his outlook on the banking industry. We also have an episode with Clayton Christopher, the founder of Deep Eddie Vodka and Sweet Leaf Tea. And we also have a bonus episode with Barry Schwartz, who gave us one of the most viewed TED Talks of all time on the paradox of choice. 
That URL again is yscouts.com forward slash podcast to access those episodes. Until next time, thanks for listening.